All right, welcome everybody to the primer. My name is Daniel Murphy. So this lecture is going to be an introduction and a survey of the week ahead. Uh, recordings unedited of the talk should be up, um, posted on the Discord uh, within a day. Uh, edited videos will go up on YouTube over the course of the week. Uh, so check out singularlearningtheory.com or the Discord for, uh, for the recordings and lecture notes. Uh, since there's a few people, if you have questions, better not to unmute yourself, uh, type questions in the chat and somebody will pass them along to me. Uh, of course, this has stopped working. No, it has not stopped working. Okay, so the primer is brought to you by the following people. Uh, the speakers are Jesse Hoogland, Edmund Lau, John Tian Chen, Ben Garrity, Liam Carroll, Rowan Hitchcock, and myself, and the organizers for this week and next week, uh, Alexander Oldenziel, Jesse Hoogland, and Stan Van Wingerden. So what are we here for? So the primer uh, is an introduction to singular learning theory and related areas of mathematics and physics as a foundation for theoretical and experimental work on AI alignment. SLT is a theory of statistical learning general enough to include neural networks, which is not true of classical statistical learning theory. Uh, it's been worked on by Sumio Watanabe, his students and a handful of others over the past 20 years. The other element of the title is alignment. Uh, we'll hear a lot more about what exactly that is um, starting this afternoon. But for the moment, I'll just sort of paraphrase uh, Norbert Wiener by saying that alignment is the problem of aiming AI systems. And by analogy, I'd like you to think about uh, the combination of a bow and an arrow. So that's another thing that you aim. Uh, that has two parts, right? So you configure the initial conditions of the bow and the arrow, and then you release the arrow. And once you've released it, you don't have much more control over where it goes. Uh, so you want to get the initial conditions correct. So that's aiming. Now, I think it's counterintuitive for many people that deploying AI systems might be analogous to firing an arrow, because many of today's computer systems and AI systems are of the form where you can turn them on, but then you can turn them off and you can change what they do. You can change the training data, uh, but many people are concerned and I'm one of them that as we move forward with more advanced AI systems, while in principle, it still might be possible to do that effectively, we may not be able to do that. And that's an old concern going back to the very beginnings of AI, back to Turing, Ian Good, Norbert Wiener, uh, von Neumann, many other people foresaw that this loss of effective control would become an issue as soon as systems became sufficiently capable. Um, to maybe double down on the analogy with the bow and arrow for a minute. So a bow and arrow is not a generic physical system, right? So you choose this system precisely because once you've fired the arrow, to put it bluntly, it's hard to dodge, right? Uh, the fact that it's hard to dodge is because it moves quickly and it's because it moves quickly that you can't effectively control it once it's launched. So you didn't choose the system to be hard to control directly, but the reason you chose it is highly correlated with the fact that it's hard to control. And AI systems are fundamentally like that. Going forward, we will choose to deploy AI systems in domains which are not easy for us to work in. For example, very high speed domains, controlling plasma in a tokamak, um, very large scale domains controlling an economy or a healthcare system or domains where there are very loose correlations that we find it hard to reason about, things like protein folding. And it's in those domains that like by the nature of the fact we're choosing to deploy the system um, and we're incentivized to do so, it's not unrelated to the fact that it will be hard to reason about what it's doing and make effective decisions about whether it's doing those things correctly and when to turn it off. Um, okay, so that means that configuring the initial conditions becomes extremely crucial, and that's uh, part of the problem of AI alignment. Okay, but what has statistical learning theory or singular learning theory got to do with that? 
uh, well, fundamentally, it's easier to aim things that you understand. Okay, so uh, we hope that statistical learning theory, singular learning theory, uh, will help to understand these systems and therefore to uh, assist with aligning them. This is not a field that exists. Like it's starting right now. <laughs> okay, so don't expect announcements of uh, 300 interesting theorems and profound results. We will say something at the end of the week of what we understand so far. We have some reason to think this is not a vain hope that this can be an interesting application of SLT. Uh, but you're here because you're interested in getting this combination off the ground. Right? Uh, yeah, maybe I'll say more about that later. Okay, so here's the schedule for the week. Let me just adjust this. Okay, so there's four tracks, as you can see here. Um, the morning track will be SLT high. So this is about developing the conceptual toolkit for uh, applying the ideas of SLT. And it's the whole point of that is that you do not have to understand two textbooks worth of algebraic geometry, empirical processes, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, to get the ideas and see how they can be used, right? And this is maybe a point which has been unappreciated uh, or underappreciated. SLT low will be the technical details, mathematical foundations, getting our hands dirty with some blow-ups uh, and other such things. The physics track uh, will go through some useful metaphors between statistical learning theory and thermodynamics and other areas of physics. It's not essential to have those kind of physical ideas to think about uh, singular learning theory, but many of us find it very helpful. So uh, that's a powerful set of ideas. And we'll be drawing on the ideas of thermodynamics extensively over the week. And then there's uh, lectures on alignment and mechanistic interpretability. So it's explicitly intended that this primer is both for mathematicians, physicists, computer scientists, and so on, interested maybe only purely in singular learning theory, that's fine, but maybe interested in it in combination with alignment and also for people coming from AI safety. So the alignment and mech interp lectures uh, hopefully give some idea for those coming from outside of AI safety why these ideas are relevant. Okay, so I think we're ready to get into the content. Does SLT5 I5 exist? Uh, it did exist. Oh, no, this slide hasn't been updated. Yeah, okay. So actually, the schedule is a little bit different. So nice catch. <laughs> okay, let's start at the beginning. So I think many of you are familiar with these images. This is from Plato's Tim Timaeus. Um, I promise this will be relevant, but stick with me for a moment. So the ancient Greeks had a model of the world. Uh, in which they thought that substances were made of mixtures of elements, air, earth, fire, and water, and a fifth one. And each of these was associated with a geometric form, namely a platonic solid. And this theory is both very beautiful and attractive uh, and uh, very wrong. So for the experts, that's low RLCT, uh, <laughs> high energy. <laughs> and some people got stuck on this for a really long time. Uh, it's actually maybe less well known in the West, but there's a very parallel development in Chinese history. So the I Ching uh, around the same time, maybe plus or minus a few hundred years, was a very beautiful symbolic calculus that was developed uh, by Chinese philosophers to reason literally about like the evolution of the world from some states into some other states in some kind of symbolic way, uh, like ast astonishing idea, uh, like 2000 years or more before its time. Uh, and that calculus inspired Leibniz in his search for the characteristic universalis and was partly responsible for him discovering binary arithmetic. Um, beautiful, but also completely wrong. So it's rubbish as a means of predicting events in the world. And both of these things, um, the platonic forms and uh, I Ching spawned 2000 years of superstitious woo and nonsense. Um, but to be fair, from the modern point of view, uh, there's also something deeply interesting and correct about those ideas, just not in the original context. And it took another 2,000 years of technological development for those ideas to actually find a context in which they were literally true. 
Um, so what you see here are two diagrams from the literature on uh, twisted bilayer graphene, topological materials, uh, magic angles. Uh, what these images represent are physicists, and these are, I mean, these are lab oriented physicists explaining to each other the classification of elementary catastrophes uh, as a key to sort of understanding the materials that they're engineering. And the classification of elementary catastrophes is not identical to, but very, very similar to the classification of platonic solids. So here you have in 2023, physicists very practically in mind going into the lab, literally designing materials whose optical and electrical properties are governed by more or less platonic solids. Okay, so thumbs up for Plato's Timaeus, just to, just have to wait a while. Okay, so what's this got to do with the topic of this uh, of this week? So the analogy I want to make here is that um, something similar has happened with large neural networks. In the sense that technology has progressed, we're now producing statistical models of sufficient scale uh, that new mathematics is required to understand them, or arguably it's required to understand them. Um, and also the properties of these large learning machines are dictated by geometry. And in fact, the geometry is not so different from that of the Van Hove singularities, which are uh, the name that the physicists have given to these um, singularities that they're encountering in the study of materials. Okay, so um, as technology progresses, it opens up new territory for mathematics that has existed for some time to be applied. So singular learning theory is not new, right? it's 20 years old, some of the fundamental theorems. Um, but maybe it's not a surprise that in connection with new phenomena like scaling laws and other very interesting emergent capabilities in neural networks, um, that there's renewed interest in these ideas. And that's, uh, that's sort of why we're here. Okay, so the key ideas for the week. Uh, the first is that thermodynamics uh, says the world is organized by phases and phase transitions. Not everything is a phase and not every change is a phase transition. Not everything learned by a neural network is related to a phase transition. That's not what we're saying. But many interesting things in the world, uh, many of the basic categories we understand are phases or at least are associated with phases. And many changes that are distinctive, interesting, and important are phase transitions. And we believe the same may be true in neural networks. So thermodynamics is the first key idea. The second is geometry. Yeah. So it's been understood for a long time how phases and phase transitions are related to differential topology and algebraic geometry. It's a well-developed field of study, stable maps. Um, it's topologists like Rene Tom, Arnold, many, many others have, have studied these connections. And under this dictionary, phases are associated to singularities. Um, so just briefly, a singularity of a function is, is a point where the function has at least non one, well, where all its derivatives vanish. Um, and unfoldings uh, is the, the singularity theory language for uh, what we call the phase transition in physics. So we'll talk a bit about this dictionary um, in the physics sessions and also in there's a, um, well, one of the physics sessions is catastrophe theory later in the week. Okay, and singular learning theory connects both of those things uh, to the behavior of learning machines. Uh, this is in some sense, not a new connection, right? So statistical physics has long been understood to be related to learning, uh, going back to Hopfield and even earlier work there's been many, many connections drawn between statistical physics and uh, optimization theory, learning. Uh, geometry has been less involved in that dictionary to date, and there's very good reasons for that. Um, so singular learning theory introduces not only algebraic geometry into the mix, uh, but even, even without that, uh, it sort of pushes forward this bridge between statistical learning theory and learning, sorry, statistical physics and learning. Um, Okay, and to tie all that into alignment, um, 
So as I said, we don't expect that, well, uh, while we don't understand uh, how neural networks, well, neural networks exposed to lots of data often manifest internal computational structures. We don't understand those structures very well, but there seems to be sufficient evidence to believe that uh, there is structure and that it can be understood. Not all of that structure probably has anything to do with thermodynamics or phase transitions, uh, but it seems that many important structures do. And again, this is only like in the last few years that we really sort of start to have uh, fully convincing evidence of this. Um, but we believe important structures do form in phase transitions. This also is not a new idea. Developmental biology has been talking about phase transitions, analogies to statistical physics, and even catastrophe theory uh, for decades. Um, so maybe you could see that as a vote of confidence in something similar being true for neural networks. And we believe, therefore, that uh, understanding phases, phase transitions, singularities, and all of that in the context of singular learning theory should allow us to say something useful about those computational structures that are being learned. And that uh, is interpretability. And after that, uh, interpretability uh, is relevant to alignment. Okay, uh, maybe I'll pause here for questions if there's any, I didn't, did I miss any in the chat? I don't think so. No. Okay. All right, onwards then. Okay, so that's at a high level. Here's the mathematical object that's going to be the center of our attention uh, over the course of the week. So the free energy formula, which is closely related to the WBIC, uh, is the main theoretical result of statistical learning theory so far. I don't know if you would agree, shall we? Yeah. Um, so this is a deep result, and it expresses the free energy um, of a statistical model in terms of a term you might call energy or loss or error, and another term, the second term here, uh, which involves the learning coefficient lambda. And it's this lambda, which is the entry point of algebraic geometry into statistical learning theory. I'm not going to explain the terms in this formula right now. That's a matter for, uh, Jesse will say something about it, this formula later today, and we'll get deep into it uh, in tomorrow's SLT high session. The point I want to make right now is that you can view this formula as like an API, right? So the free energy formula, if you understand what the terms in this formula mean and what this formula is about, you can go ahead and use it to say non-trivial things about uh, learning machines and in particular neural networks. And convincing you of that will be the whole point of tomorrow's SLT high. So I'm just going to take this formula and show you how you can say some simple things using it. Um, and that's uh, what thermodynamics is about, right? So my undergraduate degree was in uh, physics and then drifted into mathematics. Uh, my most hated subject as an undergrad was thermodynamics. I thought it was the most stupid thing ever. I thought my lecturer didn't un even understand calculus properly. Uh, and I sat there thinking, this is like this is like cooking class. I just take a fundamental relation, I do some derivatives, and then there's a laundry list of stuff I can say. <laughs> like, show me, like, where, where's the string theory, man? Where's some mathematics? <laughs> okay, but I was so completely wrong. That was the best class I ever took as an undergrad because that's the leverage of thermodynamics, right? Like, you know, one relation and some first-year calculus and algebra, and you can say heaps of stuff about a system. It just happened I didn't care about the statements as an arrogant uh, youngster, but that's the power of thermodynamics, right? And uh, this free energy formula is a fundamental relation uh, for statistical learning theory. It's not the end of the theory, right? Uh, there's much more to be done, but already we can do something, some very interesting things with this. Okay, so having introduced the free energy formula, the aim of the primer can be stated a bit more precisely as explaining what this formula means and where it comes from. At the end of the week, you'll see a sketch of the proof. And that's an SLT low. Um, and on Friday, I'll show you how this caches out in an example, the toy models of superposition that has uh, been of some interest in the alignment and interpretability community. So that's the uh, 
That's the goal of the week. Uh, there are many more I could add to this list of references, but the canonical references, the textbooks of singular learning theory are Watanabe's two books. The first, The Gray Book, uh, Algebraic Geometry and Statistical Learning Theory in 2009, and then The Green Book in 2018. And the theory did develop a bit between the two. There are a few small mismatches, like differences in notation. Um, we'll be referring to both. Um, and there's also many other papers. Um, you can see singularlearningtheory.com or the uh, MetaUni SLT seminar webpage for, for more references. Um, but these are the basic ones. Okay. So SLT high, SLT low, physics, alignment, make interp. And on Wednesday evening uh, at six, there will be an address by Watanabe, um, which will also be streamed on this uh, Zoom link. So the plan for the rest of the talk is for me to go through each of the talks in this schedule and tell you a little bit uh, about what's going to be in it. Okay, I already said a little bit about what the first SLT high lecture is going to be. Uh, this is a somewhat mysterious diagram from section 7.6 of the gray book. Uh, I'm going to explain that tomorrow. This is a non-trivial consequence of the free energy formula, this picture. Um, so this is a picture of generalization error uh, against number of samples. And uh, the diagram is illustrating the change in the nature of the singularity, which determines the currently kind of preferred parameter as the number of samples increases. Okay, so this is a very interesting um, angle on the learning process. So in SLT high one, I'll introduce the free energy formula, um, sort of explain what the terms in it mean, and then show you how to use it to uh, predict phase transitions uh, for some meaning of predict, right? So given, I'll define phases and given values of uh, the energy and learning coefficient, we'll talk about when we expect phase tr transitions to happen and uh, the susceptibilities that diverge at those phase transitions. And I'll say a little bit about kind of dummies theory of um, double descent and uh, scaling laws as a consequence of those ideas. SLT high two, um, Liam Carroll is going to take those ideas about phases, phase transitions, free energy, and so on, uh, which will be basically purely abstract. There'll be no examples really in that lecture. It's just theory. Uh, Liam's going to take those ideas and show you what they mean in basically a minimal neural network that has first and second order phase transitions. So this is a one hidden layer ReLU network. Um, and Liam's going to talk about all the symmetries. You can classify all the possible symmetries of that network. Uh, many of those have been discussed, but there's like one quite strange one. Um, and he'll explain how those symmetries give rise to phase transitions as you vary the true parameter, uh, or as you vary the data that the network is learning from. And there will be lots of eye candy, because <laughs> Liam's good at that. Okay, SLT high three is going to be up in the meaning of the learning coefficient, the RLCT, the real log canonical threshold. This is the new thing really in the free energy formula. The other term is just a loss. Uh, it'll be familiar to you when I've explained it. Uh, but the learning coefficient is exotic uh, from the point of view of uh, machine learning uh, and statistical learning theory. Uh, I'm coming from the other side. I'm coming from algebraic geometry. So to me, this is like the not exotic thing in singular learning theory. Um, but it takes some explanation. It's not, I mean, the definition makes it look maybe like you need to know a lot of algebraic geometry and you need to know about zeta functions or something to, to really understand what this term means. And to work with it, to some degree you do. I mean, to prove things about it, that's something you need to know. But uh, Really, it's a very down-to-earth object. Uh, so I'll present several different angles on the RLCT, and hopefully by the end of that, you, you understand that this is exactly what it has to be, and it's very closely related to uh, things that you understand as measures of complexity. 
And the final lecture of SLT high uh, will be about uh, superposition, as I said. So this is a uh, small neural network that was introduced by Elhage et al. from Anthropic in a paper two years ago. I forget when. Last year. Time flies. Yeah, okay. Uh, last year. Um, very interesting little model uh, exhibits um, some interesting behavior in connection with interpretability. Uh, but even independently of any connection to alignment, this, is, this model is a fantastic golden little gem from the point of view of singular learning theory because it exhibits many interesting phase transitions and other structures that are genuinely like not easy to find good examples of. So I'll talk about that and the relation between the phase transitions we observe in this model and structure formation. And it's uh, like many things we care about in this connection between SL SLT and alignment are just exhibited very clearly in this, in this toy model. Okay. So that's it for SLT high, SLT low, the first one of which will be today. So this will be the next lecture, SLT low one. Um, Edmund Lau is going to present an introduction to statistical learning. Um, you'll, you'll learn the basic language of Bayesian probability and see many of the players that will appear throughout the rest of the week, kale divergence, generalization error, uh, et cetera. And um, yeah, I think plenty of examples from what it looks like here. So in the second lecture of SLT Low, Edmund's going to build on that and uh, take you from the regular case, which is kind of classical statistical learning theory or the framework that like if you learn statistics, uh, you would have learned mostly about theorems that hold in the regular case. Uh, and step through some intermediate cases between there and like the horrible 100 million dimensional singularity of GPT-4. Um, so there are intermediate cases where the math from the regular case still sort of works. Uh, and that's a very useful bridge as you're trying to build intuition about the sort of genuinely singular case. In SLT low three, John Tian is going to introduce algebraic geometry. Um, there won't be a lot of algebraic geometry this week. This is the only lecture that's going to involve it in a serious way. Um, he's going to introduce blowing up and resolution of singularities and actually define the RLCT from the geometric point of view. Um, yeah, this uh, Watanabe, uh, besides being mathematically producer of profound ideas is also quite an artist. He has some great, great <laughs> graphics on his own page. Um, I'll, I'll flash up another one at the end. Uh, but uh, I like I like the uh, the serene but deathly beauty of algebraic geometry on the horizon and <laughs> the friendly <laughs> statistical learning theory. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I've forgotten what the topic of this lecture was, Edmund. What's this one about? As a proof of the free energy formula. Yeah, yeah, the, the, the number changed. Yeah, that's right, okay. Yeah, the proof, I couldn't find a good picture for the proof. So, um, so SLT low four at the end of the week um, is going to actually go through a sketch of the free energy formula. Um, obviously to really understand the proof, you kind of need to read the gray book, um, but the idea is uh, you can, get some intuition from the ideas in the proof without, without having gone through all that. So the physics track, uh, Jesse's in the first lecture going to introduce uh, the dictionary with thermodynamics and statistical physics, um, which for those of you coming from physics, I think is kind of a, a life raft into the foreign world of statistical learning because you can just think ah, they're just talking about the Boltzmann distribution, and the partition function, and I know about that. And uh, you don't, to some degree, you can just work with those objects and not even care that it's got to do with learning. Um, and that's uh, kind of a profound thing, really. And there are many ideas in both directions that actually, I mean, some of the open things to do in connection with SLT are simply moving ideas backwards and forwards across this bridge. There are many ideas in SLT that are genuinely new in a physical context uh, and vice versa, right? So just name a couple. I mean, uh, SLT definitely needs to import renormalization group flow. 
and uh, statistics, statistical physics actually hasn't really gotten the relevance of resolution of singularities, even though, I mean, string theory exists and uh, resolutions are present there, but sort of everyday statistical physics is still a bit behind on that front. So in physics two, uh, Jesse is going to talk about first and second order phase transitions, stability and fluctuations and uh, control parameters such as temperature and pressure. So this will be a way for you to take the, the sort of informal idea of phase transitions that you have and start to push it into maybe through the physical story into um, statistical learning. And a, a lot of this language is uh, how we're going to think about the applications of SLT to interpretability going forward. So things like susceptibilities and divergences at phase transitions are sort of how we're currently thinking about applying these ideas in that context. So this is important. Yeah, maybe there's an idea here, um, which I'll introduce before describing what's in the lecture. So I think one of the most counterintuitive things for people uh, in my experience when you try and tell them about singular learning theory is that uh, statisticians maybe think that, uh, like the head of my department, for example, um, think that it's very unlikely the true parameter will actually be a singularity on a set where the Fisher information is, is degenerate, right? So if, because that's a set of measure zeros. So singularities are kind of like distinct things, right? They're lower dimension than the space of all parameters. So they're measure zero. So from some point of view, you can say, well, like they're not the generic thing. So how maybe I can just choose to ignore them. Um, and it, it's not true, but it takes some argument to understand intuitively why it's not true. In statistics, I think people haven't really done that exercise until now, but in physics, people have gotten this for a very long time. Right? Um, so uh, for example, in Nonlinear dynamics, um, it's uh, the way you introduce it to students. These pictures are from Strogatz's textbook, um, which Jesse will be speaking from and I've taught courses from in the past. Um, in nonlinear dynamics, the idea that globally trajectories are controlled by singularities at points that may be very far away from where the trajectory currently is, uh, is a basic organizing principle for the subject. Right? So even though singularities may be a measure zero set, their influence is everywhere. And this uh, is part of the link between geometry and topology, right? Geometry is about like, configurations at points in the case of singularities, and topology is about global behavior. And this is a sort of a deep idea in, in mathematics, and, and this is one of its manifestations in physics. Um, it's true even in first year calculus, right? You learn to describe the behavior of functions by looking for their critical points, the local minima and maxima. And then after you've found the local minima and maxima, you know where things are increasing and decreasing, then otherwise the function is, there's some class of functions that have that behavior and they're all kind of the same, right? So there's this sort of like a very, very far reaching generalization of that set of ideas. Um, and Jesse will say a little bit about that. Now, some of that story about how geometry and topology are linked uh, has sort of been developed under the name of catastrophe theory. So Gilmore uh, has an excellent textbook on this, and I'll be giving a bit of a basic run through of the early chapters of Gilmore's book, um, talking particularly about the cusp catastrophe, uh, which is related to, um, you can see a solid liquid gas phase transition is, is a, these are sort of the same diagram in some sense, although uh, it takes a little bit of math to see why they're the same. The cusp bifurcation will come up again in the story of the toy model's superposition on Friday. So this um, sort of developed, this lecture is sort of leading to that. So that's it for SLT low, SLT high and physics and the alignment track. Um, Jesse is going to first present the case for existential risk from AI. And this will cover some of the reasons to think that superhuman AIs are not only possible, but likely on our current uh, trajectory and why such AIs will not automatically result in human flourishing. 
Um, so these are kind of arguments that if you're coming from the AI safety point of view, uh, you'll be familiar with, but uh, it's not obvious, I think, if you're coming, uh, if this is a new idea to you, uh, it's not obviously the case that there's something to worry about here. Uh, but if you think about it and go through the arguments, and they're fairly straightforward arguments, I think it's hard to argue that, uh, that there's nothing to them. So in the second talk, Jesse's going to go through uh, the current state of AI safety um, from agent foundations to current plans for alignment and interpretability a little bit, I think. Um, and he'll start to outline why we think that phase transitions, including during the training process, should be a, a key organizing principle for uh, one way to, to move forward on technical alignment. So then we have two mechanistic interpretability lectures. Uh, the first by Ben Garrity is going to go through the toy models of superposition paper. Uh, I've already said something about that, so maybe I won't say uh, much more. In the second MechInterp lecture, Rowan's going to talk about another paper from Anthropic by Olson et al., which examines phase transitions in connection with a structure called induction heads, uh, which seem to be tightly related to the emergent capability of in-context learning. And this uh, is a really important piece of science, uh, I think. So some of the open problems in connection with the idea for applying SLT to alignment uh, lie around studying these two models, toy models of superposition and the induction heads model, and seeing if we can say something about the phases and phase transitions involved in both of them. I claim we already know how to say something in the toy models of superposition case. Uh, I don't know anything about induction heads, so this is kind of an interesting topic for discussion next week. And then we're going to finish um, as I said, with an outline of how we think all this might come together uh, to direct something uh, that we're calling developmental interpretability, where we look at the phases and phase transitions over the course of training and assemble those structures into um, something that is a model of the computational structure that's inside the final learned network. All right, and that's it for the synopsis. Uh, I'm going to finish with a little bit of an FAQ, partly tongue-in-cheek, uh, in order that maybe you feel uh, open to ask questions in the chat. Um, but before I go through the FAQ, um, maybe on the topic of singularities being kind of exceptional uh, rather than generic, uh, it's important to note that the reason why we sort of see singularities appearing in our models uh, is that in some sense, the singularities are also in the world, right? The world is not in a generic high entropy state. It's very ordered. Uh, and some of the generating processes that generate that order are hierarchical and structured in a way that naturally means singularities when you model them. Um, so it's really not a surprise that non-degenerate singularities appear in statistical learning, properly understood. Um, so, yeah, I think at the moment we're in a bit of a strange situation where uh, the, the logic of SLT seems new and a bit exotic, but in some sense it's uh, the way it has to be. Um, hopefully you'll agree by the end of the week. Okay, do I need to read Hartshorn, Callan's textbook on thermodynamics, Gilmore's textbook on catastrophe theory before even doing anything to do with SLT? Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> do hard on exercises that's, that's the key no you don't need to know all that uh, I mean it's beautiful mathematics uh, and you know it's certainly uh, foundational work in SLT of which there's much to be done uh, will require deep knowledge of one or more of these things um, and, and the many other prerequisites to SLT as well but I think it's a little bit of a distraction um, to see this pile of interesting mathematics uh, when you encounter SLT, uh, both a distraction and maybe triggers a bit of a fear reflex where you think that, uh, like, hopefully SLT isn't true because then I won't be able to understand it. Um, 
as, as I said, over the course of the week, we'll be seeing how the free energy formula can say interesting things. Uh, and you can just sort of cut off the level of detail there, at least to begin with. Is SLT already a theory, a sort of complete theory of deep learning? No, um, not in my opinion. So there are various gaps. So the biggest one is between the Bayesian perspective and the kind of SGD oriented perspective of deep learning. Um, we'll discuss that, I guess, not so much over the course of the week because it's more like open problems, but it'll be a topic we'll, we'll get to uh, next week. Um, those aren't insurmountable, but it's not like just off the shelf SLT, like is the answer right now and explains all the mysteries of deep learning. Um, I would say that once you internalize what SLT is saying, deep learning doesn't look strange, right? It's not weird that neural networks can generalize well, nor is it weird that things like these internal structures appear or that there is something like scaling laws going on. Uh, that doesn't mean we can explain all those things yet, uh, but it certainly reduces the surprise and that's already worth something, I would say. Are the theorems true? <laughs> I know this seems like a weird statement. This is not like, I'm uh, not doubting Watanabe. Uh, but I have to say, when I opened up the textbook, uh, and I first looked at it years ago before I came back and looked at it more seriously, I thought, this is so weird. Uh, and then when I came back to it, and I thought, OK, this looks super profound and yet nobody is talking about it, right? Like there's very little, there's, there's not really a community out there. I mean, there's Watanabe and his students and they've done amazing work and, and a few others uh, like Xiaowei here, uh, but it's not something that has been developed by a large community. And, you know, I'm a pure mathematician. I'm used to small communities, right? But somehow the situation with SLT was weird. Like if it's true and, it, like it's obviously on its face beautiful and links very interesting things. Uh, if it were true, how come people aren't talking about it? So I had to suspect it was false. So, uh, but now we've checked most of the theorems and uh, no, it's true. Okay, so uh, people were just missing the boat. That's it. <laughs> uh, yeah, re-missing the boat. Um, I don't actually know the reason why it's not better known. I think it's changing, going to change very rapidly over the course of uh, the next year or so, it seems. Um, I think it's mostly just that applied mathematicians um, aren't generally looking to take on board fundamentally new math um, or develop fundamental new math. It's not a criticism, that's their job, but they're, they're meant to take tools that are relatively well-developed and, and use them to do interesting things. Um, so I think that many people looking, including in ML, looking to apply um, mathematics generally aren't up for spending a year like doing nothing else, but sort of acquire an understanding of SLT in case it might pay off. That's like not the trade-off people are looking to make. I think that's one of the reasons, but um, maybe there are others. Yeah, unsingularity is just a nuisance. Um, it's interesting because singularities have been discussed in other parts of information geometry, right? I mean, SLT is very close to information geometry. In case you're curious, information geometry, sort of like the differential geometry take on the story that SLT is like the algebraic geometry take on uh, at some high level. Uh, but of course, differential geometry has to is scared of the singularities. So obviously SLT is better. Um, and a lot of the attitude towards singularities in optimization theory has been that they're a nuisance, right? Like neural networks will get stuck in local minima. They'll get stuck in a saddle point. Uh, it would be better if there were no local minima in the lost landscape and you could just roll all the way to a global minima. That would be utopia. Um, now, even without SLT, we know that's like really a bit naive. Um, we know plenty of situations in, say, physics where the local minima of a potential sort of classify very interesting geometric forms, right? So it's not like, it's not like there isn't structure in the things that aren't global minima, but if you're driven by getting the lowest loss to like solve the problem, then it makes sense to be uh, worried that singularities or critical points are in the way. Um, it's not straightforward to refute this, right? Uh, but I think the evidence that's emerging, and I'll speak a bit more about on Friday, 
is that the, the singularities are where the information is, right? And passing through them or near them is like sort of exactly the process of translating that information into the internal structure. So um, one should take singularities sort of seriously on their own terms. Uh, there's a lot of singularities that are sort of generic. So um, you may be familiar with say ReLU networks where there's various kinds of discrete and continuous symmetries that aren't very interesting. Um, if SLT were only about those, it would be a very shallow theory. It's not, there's more to singularities than just somehow the generic ones. Uh, and that'll come up in several talks over the course of the week. Yeah, I think another thing that people come away with a bit of a misleading impression of looking at SLT for the first time is that it's entirely about computing RLCTs. Uh, and then if you take that view, then uh, maybe it seems pretty pointless to study SLT because nobody's ever going to know the RLCT of GPT-3 except GPT-4 or 5. <laughs> um, no, we're not going to compute our LCTs of these things. Um, although, you know, the idea of doing resolution of singularities in a billion dimensions has a certain kind of masochistic charm to it. Um, but that's not the point, right? So uh, and here the analogy with theoretical physics and sort of applied physics is, is also uh, very useful, right? So people apply thermodynamics to all kinds of systems even though computing the theoretical values of like the scaling exponent requires like 40 years of theoretical work and like a Nobel prize, right? So it's, it's not actually a prerequisite to apply these theories to be able to compute the theoretical quantities. Knowing that the learning coefficient sits in the free energy formula uh, is to some degree like what you need to know. And uh, there's lots of interesting geometry in computing RLCTs. Uh, it's not that I'm not interested in that, and it's not interesting, but it's not, it's not like, we're not bottlenecked on that. Okay, uh, where do I start? Yeah, we'll talk about open problems and um, sort of projects in week two. Yeah, so as a follow-up to this, we'll probably do something with more details uh, mathematically later in the year, uh, but you know, ask questions about it uh, if you want it to happen. Volunteer if you want it to happen. Spot the difference. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, on the topic of lots of mathematics being involved in SLT, this is another one of Watanabe's, well, he, he didn't put the shog off in it. Uh, this is another one of Watanabe's great diagrams. Um, so there's a lot of interesting mathematics between um, I guess this is the, the cold mountain uh, between algebraic geometry and, uh, and machine learning and AI. Um, okay, and we'll leave it there for today. And uh, questions? Ben, yeah. Can you explain a bit more about how you came? How I came to SLT. Uh, that will seem very convoluted. Okay, um, so my PhD was in algebraic geometry. So I did derived categories and uh, triangulated categories, growth and duality. Um, and I worked on singularity theory. Um, I sort of got string theory pilled by a friend of mine who asked me to work on matrix factorizations. So I worked on sort of the border of algebraic geometry and string theory for a number of years. Uh, and then we wrote a paper in like 2016, which had, I don't know if, well, I'm at the Topos Institute, so there should be a picture of like the, like the, the adjunction string diagram somewhere. So there's, uh, there's adjunctions in two categories in connection with that stuff. And, you know, there's like inside some calculation, there's a very weird little bit of algebra involving non-commutative differential forms. And it looked to me like, so I'm just going to wave with my hand, right? Like, so if you take a, a function that has two critical points like that and you kind of smooth it out and then it becomes a line, that's like the, that's like the topological version of an adjunction. Um, and there's some very interesting algebra inside that. Anyway, long story short, I thought like that algebra is like doing the computation. 
like, what is going on with topology, algebra, and computation? So then I went and learned linear logic, and then I spent years doing linear logic. And then, and then I picked up Watanabe's book, and like, there's someone saying, computation, learning, and algebraic geometry. And I'm like, this is a trap. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so yeah, then I started reading his book, and uh, yeah, I think uh, I th think it's the th the books that have had the most Im impression on me as a mathematician were EGA and uh, and Watanabe's book. I think it's profound and very beautiful, and uh, unlike everything else I've ever done, like actually connected to things that uh, seem critical in the real world. So. Uh, EGA, um, the Bible of Algebraic Geometry. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, maybe you can do that. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, one question. To what extent does SLP take into account computational considerations? Oh, I see. Uh, you. Whoever asked that question, you mean in a fundamental sense, like uh, like time complexity, or just mean in sort of a practical sense, like you can't do Markov chain Monte Carlo in hundred dimensions? Theoretical sense, yeah, not at all. I would say, um, I mean, there is there's sort of like a di division between intractable things, like computing the posterior, and tractable things, uh, which is kind of like bread and butter sort of a st statistics. But in terms of time complexity, or an understanding of fundamental constraints involved in computing these quantities, I would, I would say it's not studied as far as I know. How does SLP relate to other frameworks? For example, case studies? Compact days. Uh, it's a good question. I think it's hard to answer briefly. Um, there are relations, um, but they're not obviously talking about the same things. I don't know. Physics one will go into that a bit. Yeah, yeah. Any interesting regulations for, for the SLT research landscape or something like that? Research landscape. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, so I have a bunch of students, uh, PhD students, master's students, some of them you'll, some of them are the speakers in the primer this week. Um, I guess mostly we've, been spending our time over the last year or two wrapping our head around the theory. Um, there isn't so much easy low-hanging fruit in SLT, which is maybe one of the reasons why it hasn't been picked up to a larger degree. Uh, but um, there are avenues for progress, I think, now. Um, so focusing on phases and phase transitions is, for example, one of the things we think is crucial going forwards. Um, and that there are theoretical problems to do with that. So it, it actually isn't, uh, isn't right now the case, I think, that the state, well, there are various generalizations of the free energy formula that are sort of necessary to, to move forward um, with the story about phases and phase transitions. So that's maybe one line of work, working on phases, phase transitions. And there we were sort of uh, bottlenecked on having a good small dimensional example. And as I mentioned, this toy models of superposition is like actually a gift. It's a tremendous example for that. Um, there's also lots of things to be done in building uh, more bridges to other parts of mathematics that are already involved in SLT, but uh, for example, I mean, there isn't anything I'm aware of um, applying stochastic DEs in the context of SLT and vice versa, applying SLT in the context of SDEs um, and more algebraic geometry. So JET schemes, um, I've spoken in some seminars in the SLT seminar at MetaUni about relevance of JET schemes. Um, yeah, I guess I could stand here all day going on about uh, open research directions, but we'll cover that uh, next week in a, a public where I see a question from Russell about accommodation, but whether 
Yeah. <laughs> Are there other questions? Oh, there's something about catastrophe. Yeah, catastrophe is a technical term. Uh, well, Tom uses it to mean event. So Rene Tom has a crazy book, uh, Structural Stability and um, Morphogenesis. Uh, crazy in a good way. Uh, he's a French mathematician. Uh, so catastrophe theory comes out of that book. And actually, a lot of the ideas we're going to be presenting about um, developmental interpretability and like these ideas about second order phase transitions and their role in development of a complex system uh, in many ways go back to Tom. So that's a brilliant book. And his term catastrophe refers to the idea that information comes from the world often in discrete events, right? So a car crashes and then you learn something. That's actually an example in his book. Uh, there's actually like basically the, like a, an implicit there's a latent version of the learning coefficient in Tom's book, believe it or not, and its connection to like volume co-dimension. Um, he calls it topological complexity. Uh, and he's, he's talking about that in, the, in this example. So a car crashes, you have like two cars, they have trajectories. There are coefficients in the trajectories, unknown, and then they crash. And then you can ask how much information do you get about the dynamics governing their behavior? And the point of his example is that the world is like, changing in some sort of smooth, continuous, unremarkable way without changing its qualitative nature. But then at discrete moments, things change in a qualitative way. And those are called catastrophes. Um, technically speaking, the um, yeah, a catastrophe is like a particular point in an unfolding of a singularity. You can imagine a one parameter family of, um, of geometric objects. Yeah, by the way, you don't have to read EGA either. <laughs> I think it looks like Jesse, you answered it. I oh, go ahead, yeah. So what do you think this will be to be a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? <laughs> <laughs> Who let this man ask questions, right? 10 years is too long. Okay. Yeah, this guy is too long timelines. <laughs> One year. Well, I think we'll have a much better understanding of um, of structure. So at the moment, I mean, it's a topic that's been discussed quite a bit in, in neuroscience and, and other places, like how structure relates to statistical learning. Uh, but I don't think it's something that has been fundamentally well addressed. Uh, and I think there's a very good reason for that. It's because structure is fundamentally tied to singularities. So. The biggest open conceptual problem and the thing that makes me the most excited about SLT is the prospect of there being a fundamentally satisfactory take on what structure in learned system is, whether you mean, whether that means circuits or hierarchy or compositionality. Uh, these things can be more than just loose analogies. They can be formal mathematical objects uh, and Differential topology, algebraic geometry, and the ideas there already point towards how to do that. Um, so I think that's where I see SLT going. And, um, I don't know if it takes a year or five years, um, but that's the. Uh, in terms of preparing, like during the primer, you should read Liam's blog posts, I guess. Um, so they've been advertised on the Discord, but Liam Carroll is just, I don't know if he's posted all of them, but he's posting a series of blog posts on, on less wrong, uh, partly covering the material in his thesis and he'll partly covering the stuff he'll be talking about this week. Uh, but those are an excellent exposition. Um, and uh, also Jesse's written a very nice blog posts uh, on, this, on similar topics. Example of a prediction you might make about GPTN or a state of the art system. I think that's an unrealistic expectation in a year. Uh, beyond analogies based on analyzing smaller systems, I 
I mean, to some extent, these, the scale of the system is irrelevant from the point of view of universal statements, right? So if there's some universal kind of properties, not in the sense of category theory, but in the sense of like universal phenomena, critical phenomena, um, if there are universal structures that appear, then they will appear in both small and large models, gate kept on some kind of scale, I guess. So I think it's plausible that we'll analyze small models, like things that are built on top of the toy models of superposition or related ideas. Um, and we'll analyze, we'll understand how to think about that in some deep mathematical way. And those would suggest structures that are present in larger models, but uh, beyond that, I, I have really no idea. Um, what do you do? Sorry? Biggest structures. Sorry? Biggest structures, biggest source of uncertainty. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned it already. It's not clear to what degree structure is. Well, there's both universality of structure, so that like understanding the computations that appear in some model, what that tells you about some other model, that could just not work. Uh, it could also be that much of the structure is sort of ad hoc bullshit, right? Like a thousand kludges stuck together with sticky tape and like accumulated special cases, et cetera, et cetera. In which case there's like no phase transitions. It's just, you roll down some hill from a random initialization and you end up somewhere. And the somewhere you end up has no more structure to it than the location in parameter space that it's at. It's just what it is, uh, in which case, well, maybe we're screwed, uh, but mathematics is not clear. Mathematics tells you anything about that. So, I, so if that's the case, so it's a question of universality and to what degree the structure that we care about actually is formed in phase transitions. Um, it seems that quite a bit is, uh, but we really don't know. I think that's a very important open question. Uh, and I, I, I think it's an open question. I really don't. No, and that would be the two. Well, if, if they're both true, okay, so if they're universal and all the structures formed in phase transitions, it could still be the case that at scale, it's impossible to understand it because every phase transition involves 1 billion parameters and uh, there's just no tools we can run fast enough to understand uh, what structure emerged in that phase transition because it's too, too entangled with everything else. Um, so maybe there's like a cluster decomposition principle what also needs to be true. So this is an idea from so in quantum field theory. Uh, you, you set up the problem in a way where you say that the S matrix in some part of space time is like independent from other parts. So if there's like a cluster decomposition principle for, for the kind of structure that emerges in phase transitions where it's like small chunks change in each transition and they're more or less, they're linked, but not too tight. Uh, if those three things are true, then I think we're in good shape. But I think all three may need to be true. So regarding specifically the first point, the structure, uh -huh. what evidence points to the thinking that that's that we might have structure in internals for large models like GPTF? Yeah, I guess there's like an outside view where it seems unlikely they would be able to perform as well as they do without some kind of internal structure that is fairly general rather than just being hundreds of kludges stuck together. Um, I think there's the changes in performance over scale, right? So, uh, okay, so well, let me start from like the more anecdotal through to the more scientific. So anecdotally interacting with uh, GPT-3, GPT-3.5, GPT-4, um, say with just math problems, you clearly get the impression that there's a more systematic understanding as you progress through the models. Um, whether that systematic understanding means more structure or not, I mean, I suppose it's an intuition that it does. Um, so that's in the large models. Um, in the smaller models, I mean, I guess we have some evidence from mechanistic interpretability that there are some algorithms internally that aren't just kludges. Um, I think the strongest example would be induction heads. Um, 
beyond that? Yeah, it's partly, to be honest, uh, just the kind of uh, Oh, your hand was up. Yeah. Oh, I need to finish. Um, it's hard to think of another explanation uh, for why increasing scale would help um, beyond there being more sort of computational structure. Um, I mean, it, it can represent more in terms of memorization, uh, but we we sort of see that. Uh, I don't think that's a sufficient explanation. So why, uh, why it couldn't be something other than memorization or structure? It could be a third thing. Yeah, could be. Um, but it seems like the most simplest explanation to me is that uh, the kind of computational structure that we would implement to solve problems is, um, well, maybe not the same as we would implement, but some kind of underlying algorithms are being learned. It seems like the simplest explanation. Also necessary for any interpretability. Sorry? Internal structure is necessary for any interpretability approach to learning. Well, not asking GPT 4 to interpret GPT 3. Um, That's just. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's a fair question because you could just have a kind of correlation based approach where you feed inputs through the network and you see which neurons activate when other neurons activate and then you. Maybe there is no internal structure that produces those patterns. It's just a kind of emergent structure that's like not reflective of anything internally. That could be the case, I really don't know. Uh, so maybe it's not the most optimistic thing to say and not very good propaganda, but I would say that I'm interested in SLT in connection with alignment, mostly because maybe we get lucky and there is structure. And if there is structure, we should like have some effort towards understanding it. I don't know that it's there. Yeah, um, getting lucky doesn't sound great. Um, what do you think of the prospects of an SLT-based approach to inform future more engineered systems rather than mm. the sort of undirected optimization that GPT may be based upon? Yeah. Uh... I think that and speculatively that would be like one of the outcomes of, I mean, if you took, if you took the structures that are in neural networks and you could understand how they formed with phase transitions and you had a kind of dependency graph between all those phase transitions and you understood the singularities involved, then, I mean, that's pretty close to an algorithm, not only from an informal point of view, but the way that, those singularities fit together is pretty much how you would write a program in like like a boardism category or something like not I mean it's not purely topology so it's not only that right? there's more but that is in some sense like if the SLT that kind of program succeeds that would mean the target for interpretability is a kind of exotic new kind of computational artifact right which is a mix of those kinds of objects and then nothing would stop you from taking that artifact and trying to like author in it directly, I guess. But I, I have no idea. How do you think about dual use? Sorry? Dual use. Dual use. Yeah. Uh, it's clearly an issue. Uh, it seems pretty clear that you could use some of these ideas to also come up with ways of increasing scaling exponents, for example, which would mean that you have much more accelerated training uh, using fewer resources or using interpretability in order to make capabilities go faster, which is a general problem for interpretability. Um, so I think that's clearly a present uh, danger, but I don't know that it's fundamentally much different to anything else you might do uh, in connection with understanding as a key to alignment. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't have a good answer to this question. I, I'm hoping to think more about it over the next couple of weeks. Yeah.
What do you think is the strongest evidence that state-of-the-art models are on the SLT side of the spectrum, not the idiosyncratic cluster of heuristics? Yeah, right. Um, I mean, uh, maybe I'm committing the sin of just uh, assuming too much. I think, I think much, you answered that already. Uh, shared knowledge. I think you answered so that already. I'll go through some, some basics here. So, I mean, we do understand that in, say, vision networks, there are some elements that are sort of, I mean, that's the original circuits work. Um, some elements that do seem to be comprehensible and implementing some kind of neural network native form of algorithm. Oh, you like, like my previous answer? Okay, well then. <laughs> <laughs> It's good. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, okay, common knowledge of circuits. Uh, yeah, we'll talk about, I mean, uh, I'm a big fan of the recent interpretability work. Uh, obviously, it's fairly exploratory, um, but I think it's uh, very intriguing as a hint of deeper structure. I think I have a lot of intuition coming from other areas as well, right? So. Uh, well, take thermodynamics, for example. Thermodynamics doesn't have to be possible, right? Like thermodynamics says that even though there are trillions of degrees of freedom in many systems that are surrounding us, nonetheless, some very small number of high level macroscopic numbers basically allow you to predict what's going to happen, at least in terms of equilibrium states. That's an amazing fact of the world. Um, but it's not an accident. So if you read Callan's book, uh, the, I think it's like Appendix C, uh, he's talking about how it's microscopic symmetries that give rise to the possibility of having thermodynamics and macroscopic observables. And maybe that's a little bit controversial uh, actually, but I think there's a lot to that principle where um, the, the existence of many basic symmetries uh, gives rise to the possibility of simple large scale descriptions of things. Now that is a phenomena about the world that we noticed and that's how we build steam engines and that's why we have thermodynamics. If you point a sufficiently capable neural network at the same phenomena, well, if it's actually good at generalization, it will find the low RLCT solution to describing that phenomena which is more or less to understand those symmetry principles and how to derive from them large scale macroscopic behavior. So the, like there's some sense in which a more capable system might actually be easier to understand because it finds the simpler solution. And in many cases, there are simpler solutions and the simple solutions are kind of hierarchical and algorithmic in nature. So maybe there's like a, uh, one of like a blessing of scale also in terms of interpretability. That would be my guess. Okay, thanks for all the easy questions. Can I, can I have some hard questions now? What is the hard question you should ask? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, I, so my other favorite uh, physics flavor is theory of deep learning is this book called principles of deep learning theory. Right, right. So it's basically like, you know, you start with the neural tangent kernel and then you look at the operator that controls the change of that, and then you look at the operators control yeah. the change of that. And then you decide that like those are all the ones you need up to order one of width square. Um I'm wondering if there are any relations between singular learning theory and this other tool. It seems kind of cool. Yeah, almost certainly I don't know what they are. Uh so I think to step back a bit, I mean, there's clearly there's clearly overlap between what SLT is saying and uh, random matrices and the connection to statistical physics there. And through that, you could get closer to, to what that book is saying. Um, yeah, the renormalization group flow arguments in that book, which they're not the first to do it. There's some other papers doing that as well, um, are very interesting. And that's something SLT could also import. Um, in terms of direct connections, I, to be blunt, I think that book oversells itself a bit in terms of, I think the approach is interesting, but it doesn't actually, well, I don't think there are theorems as strong as what Watanabe is saying that you can derive from that approach currently, right? So uh, 
for example, the description of the free energy and the role of the learning coefficient and so on. So I, I think it's an interesting approach. I'm not, uh, I'm not like dropping everything to work on it. So that says something, um, but I think there's a lot to learn there. I, I mean, the, the point of view, the, the physicists who are, I mean, I, I guess it's um, Bo Yeda, who are the other authors? Like um, Hanin, Dan Roberts. Dan Roberts, right. Yeah, yeah, they seem to be very capable people. Uh, yeah, so the short answer is I, I don't know enough about that approach to say, but I, I suspect that connections could be made there. Yeah. Actually, I mean, I was maybe underwhelmed by the book, but uh, Boris Hanin has a maybe some subset of the authors of the book have a paper just out recently, which is much more impressive, building on that work. Uh, so I, I have updated to take that much more seriously as a result of that recent paper. Is there a connection between attempts to make inner representations of models more identifiable in something? Oh, you mean like, uh, like, replacing superposition with dictionary learning and that kind of thing, like trying to learn differently in order to make. Okay, can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Seems so. Uh, the Hanin paper, uh, I don't remember. It just came out in uh, PLOS within the last couple of weeks. I'll, I'll put a link in the Discord at some point later. Uh, the question, but inner representations of models more identifiable. Yeah, I, I'm not sure that's actually a good idea. Uh, I have a bit of a bitter lesson, knee jerk reaction to that, where like, human thinks thing is more represent more identifiable maybe is like actually orthogonal to like the real algorithm that's supposed to be learned there uh can i make maybe a fundamental uh repeat of bridge q and a uh, i was just trying to figure out the nature of the question so maybe that's not useful um maybe i'll reframe the question uh and answer a reframed question so the reframed question is contrast two things. One is like letting them, like having networks do whatever they do best and find the solution that they want to find and then try and understand it versus having a more constrained search space so that you sort of know in advance that the thing it's going to find uh, is comprehensible. That of course has a very like good old fashioned AI flavor to it. Uh, and there's no real reason I think to think you'll succeed to a greater degree than that did. Um, that's maybe a rude answer, but uh, feels like 
that's a no man's land where, I mean, the advantage of letting the thing do what it wants is that maybe it's sufficiently universal and like following the underlying mathematical structure closely enough that it finds something that is simple and then you understand it. Whereas the, the I'm just communicating instincts, right? I haven't really thought about this, but uh, if, you, if you take this more structured thing and then try and find a solution, maybe you don't get the benefits of that universality and you don't actually end up with the benefits of interpretability either. But that's just a guess, right? it's not ignorant. Uh, Okay, uh, I guess we should stop in a few minutes. Is there a last question? Or... Right okay, well, thanks everyone. And we'll... So we'll be resuming for SLT low in 11. Yeah, 11. Yeah. 11. Yeah, thank you very much to the Topos Institute and to Xiaowei for hosting us here. It's uh, it's very kind. Yeah, thank you very much. Chris?